Welcome to Raising OKC Kids, Conversations with Metro Family in Oklahoma City. I'm Erin Page, and joining me today is Senator Julia Kurt to talk about education in Oklahoma. Welcome, Senator. Thanks so much for being here. I'm glad to. Very glad to. I am looking forward to this conversation today, but before we get started, I want to tell our listeners a bit more about you. And first off, congratulations are in order as Senator Kurt was just recently elected Senate Minority Leader elect with that term to begin in late 2024. Senator Thank Kurt you. was originally elected in 2018, re-elected in 2022, and she represents District 30, which includes parts of Northwest OKC, Bethany, and War Acres. Among many other initiatives, she has been a champion for mental health services, public education, and inclusive disability services. Before she was elected to the Oklahoma State Senate, she led a statewide arts and culture nonprofit organization for almost 20 years. She and her husband have two children who attend public schools in Oklahoma City. So Julia, let's first acknowledge that the political climate in Oklahoma can be exhausting, even for those of us on the very outskirts. But unfortunately, that also sometimes means that the good our legislators accomplish on citizens' behalf can get overlooked or overshadowed. So what have been some of your proudest moments as a state senator thus far? Well, first off, I'll just say, um, you know, I come at this as a public school parent. That's really why I ended up running for office. I'd been very involved with the arts and working with artists across the state. And had gotten more interested in, you know, what are those policy decisions that affect small businesses and affect creative people. Um, but I really care a lot about arts education and kids having access to a complete education. My kids started in our neighborhood public school, which is Cleveland, part of Oklahoma City Public Schools. And so I got kind of a crash course. Any of you who've had kids go through school, you get a crash course in the decisions that are being made and how they affect your kids. Um, literally, our first year, they cut... Um, a teacher position. They had a science position that got cut. And then three or four years later, later due, due to the um, budget cuts at the state level, they cut arts ed um, and they cut out our visual arts educator. And so, I mean, I immediately saw things in a different light and got more engaged. I, I don't know if others have gone through this, but, you know, I started, we started parents talking to our principal and she said, this is not my decision. We went to our school board. They said, yeah, we don't, we just don't have the money. We have to cut the the, the things that are not necessary. Um, and so that led me to the state level, which I'd already been involved with at my arts organizations. But I think that empowerment as parents to go and talk to the decision makers really mattered. And I, I wasn't happy with the answers we were getting about the state decisions and how they impacted our kids. So to me, I think anytime folks can feel more uh, like their voice uh, is going to the right place. It doesn't always change, uh, but that was leading up to the walkout. Um, so I think, I hope that was eye-opening for a lot of people about the challenges we face as a state. But um, since getting in office, I think learning about the budget is, I know it's geeky, but this is, when I got there, I realized how much the budget is the biggest thing we do as a state. We're talking about overall, including federal spending, 25 billion plus that's spent by the state each year. And that doesn't even count tax policy that affects a lot of our finances. That's a huge impact on how our communities are, what's being served, what those priorities are. And so becoming a real student of the budget has been important to me advocacy wise. And, you know, when I got to the legislature, there's a lot of amazing education advocates and champions in the legislature. We have we had a great group of former educators who got elected in 2018 with me. Um, they're the primary voices to me on schools. They've lived it. They've been there. We have former principals, early childhood, other educators. And so they really bring that voice of classroom. They're, they're speaking up for those important issues. So I, I don't need to talk about that except for as a parent. Um, but when it comes to the money, I want to understand it because when people are advocating around the money, sometimes, um, it's so confusing to understand where the money comes from, how it flows. I want to I want to understand those things so that I can help people get to the bottom of those decisions. So I would say just becoming knowledgeable in that area is important. Um, but as a total, just a segue, um, helping launch the Legislative Mental Health Caucus has been one of the most gratifying things for me about 
almost three years ago now, we started it as a way to continue some of the work of advocates across the state to work on mental health issues with more uh, efficiency and effectiveness. You know, we, we, we see issues around public services, you know, who's getting served with preventative or um, crisis care. We see issues around our schools, um, what's happening on mental health and needs uh, in our schools. And people have recognized now that it's a crisis. I mean, I think when I came into office, I heard from a lot of people that had personal experiences of their family members or themselves going through treatment or addiction or uh, various diagnoses and how that impacted the whole family. But I think now we're understanding also how private insurance affects that, how access to services and and also providers um, trying to find mental health care right now is a real challenge. So working on those issues, we've had some real progress like around virtual mental health treatment before COVID. You couldn't, those providers couldn't get reimbursed that's a huge issue for them. They have to, in their business model, be able to reimburse for serving people. So now rural people and others are getting served through virtual visits. And that was actually a state level mandate to be covered. Um, those kinds of things are really satisfying to me. I really like the big picture, looking at the long-term change we want to make, which to me is preventative um, rather than dealing with crisis. But um, being able to help at the private level and the public level means a lot to me. I would say just as a like a parent on the very outskirts of all of this kind of watching what's been going on and what you've been able to accomplish while you've been in office, just the normalization of talking about mental health and talking about those resources at the state level, um, talking about advocating for your kids education at the state level. Um, that trickles down to parents like me who go, oh, okay, this is normal. And, and I think it helps show other parents in particular how and where they can step in and advocate, even it's, if it's just, you know, in our little corners of the world. So I appreciate the work that you've done on both of those fronts and, and how you've really been able to help normalize that for a lot of people around the state. I mean, I learned a lot getting into office. Just did you know that we have something like a seven year lag between when uh, Oklahomans have first have symptoms of mental health conditions and when we get uh, diagnosis and treatment. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of that's in those teenage years. A lot of kids might begin showing symptoms at 12, 13, 14, 15. And I think if we're not tuned in, if we don't have access to the people to help us know, um, people go a long time and those crises get worse and worse. The other thing that just shocked me to my core, and I think that I had never this had never been a top issue for me, but Oklahoma's average for kids first drink is 12. Mm -hmm. And that just blew my mind. And a lot of times that is a reaction to um, trauma or a reaction to um, if they have a mental health condition, they're trying to, you know, seeking substances to, to, to deal with their anxieties or their challenges. I mean, I was just floored by that because I have a 12 year old and the idea of her drinking just shocks me. Um, but it's happening all across our state. And I think that that's a like interconnecting conditions. If we're not treating mental health, if we're not dealing with substance use and our schools aren't places where kids can access that help. Um, I think we're seeing the results of that and it's, and it's scary. So in hearing about all the things that you have to think about and know about, I can only imagine that it can be overwhelming to review, research, field all of this information, all of these decisions you're making on a daily basis, and that it's important for your mental health to take a break from that sometimes. How do you balance the weight of your job as a legislator with your everyday life? Yeah, uh, that's interesting. I mean, during session, it's more challenging just because we have a lot of events and activities and meetings and bills. Um, but, you know, my number one escape is family. You know, we we do a lot of downtime with the kids. I have a 12 year old and a 16 year old. My husband's um, loves to encourage me to take it easy. So uh, we definitely have good downtime together. Lots of meals together, lots of games, that kind of stuff. Um, the other big thing, I, I really restarted my enjoyment of reading um, since being in the legislature. It's kind of funny that I read all these bills, but then my pleasure is also reading. Um, but I kind of, I don't know how you all are, but I was a big book reader before I had kids. And then I just couldn't read for years because I would fall asleep every time. <laughs> so now I'm back to just loving to read. And that's been great for me um, when I feel like the conversations at the Capitol are so frustrating and aren't talking about what I want. I can either escape in fiction or I can read some nonfiction that really connects the dots for me because it's big ideas and big challenges. Some of them seem 
just impossible to fix. Um, but we have to take steps as we go. And so those little rest and reprieve really help me. That's good affirmation for all the rest of us parents that we need to do the same thing. Find those moments of rest and, and naps. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan yes. of naps. So. <laughs> So we are talking about education today. Uh, Metro Family just released our annual education guide at the beginning of January. I have been reporting on education in our state for many, many years. My three kids all attend public schools. And to be honest, in preparing for this issue, it felt harder than ever to find those glimmers of hope and positivity in our state education system. So Julia, as a state legislator, as a mom of two kids in public schools, what do you think are the biggest challenges facing our state's education system right now? Well, I mean, we have a huge challenge around investment and commitment to what kids really need. Um, certainly what we're seeing is a re-elevation um, of standardized testing um, as a priority. And I don't know about anyone else, but standardized testing doesn't capture the depths of my kids, um, both of my children don't test well, uh, but are very smart and capable in many different ways. And I think even will have good academic achievement, but testing is not where they're, they're going to show that. Um, it disturbs me when we elevate those standardized tests. That's a huge part of how we grade the schools right now, which I'll just point out as a self-imposed grading. I think that's a big thing I feel like are these um, priorities uh, being focused around standardized testing, um, this idea of success for our kids uh, meanwhile, well-rounded children who know how to learn, who enjoy learning, are going to be the people who have satisfactory lives and who learn on the job in the future um, and become the leaders of the future. And I think we we get end up at odds um, with what kids really need um, when we prioritize things like standardized testing um, and that, that pressure of grading schools. Um, I'm very concerned that we're re-emphasizing that, especially right after COVID. I was thinking today about the kids that you know, my daughter's first standardized tests were the year we came back, not quite full time um, into the schools. And then she was taking a standardized test three weeks after being full time back to school. And what does that show us about the well-being of our kids? What does that show us about their capacity? I'm just afraid that we're per That's one of my biggest concerns is this emphasis. Um, I'm also very concerned about the uh, lack of community mindedness around our public schools. Uh, there's very much a us and them um, rhetoric and dialogue um, that puts us at odds with community members if you are a public school family uh, and also undermines trust in our schools. So, so many of our educators are also public school parents. Um, and I, I, the us and us and them mindset, I think creates a lot of that that challenge. So, I don't know how um, other parents do it, but I certainly have seen in our schools that we build trust when we know our educators, when we know the community, when we know each other. Um, and when we don't, like when I was my kid's first year in kindergarten, I didn't get to see the teachers ever because I was having before care and after care. And I'll tell you that undermined my ability to trust the educator because I didn't know them. And so when I would hear from them, I hadn't actually interfaced with them. And I think that we, when we have communities that aren't connected to or talking to each other, I think that undermines that trust, which also is our community trust, frankly. So that's the challenge side. Did you want to go to the possibility let's, side? Let's talk about the remedies. What, what do you think the remedies to some of those challenges could be? To me, a huge part of it is parents um, advocating for what they know is best for kids. I, The primary voices at the Capitol are paid lobbyists working on specific issues. So you do not have, we have, a, there's been a big rise of the Parent Legislative Advocacy Committee. I'm so grateful that they're up there, but it doesn't compare to the amount of paid people who are speaking for a specific special interest. I hear more from a lobbyist for specific testing type that wants to be uh, contracted by the state than I hear from individual parents. And I know it can be overwhelming. Um, I think people feel like they don't know what to say, but I think saying, you know, my kid's having a great experience in public schools is also valuable because legislators need to know that there are many, many families who are having good experiences or um, the challenges we face are things that are solvable if we had the right resources. Um, that kind of message is valuable for, for people to convey. Um, so I think communicating, um, being a voice at the Capitol is very important. I think investing in your own 
area school, making sure that you're getting to know those folks, that you're building trust in your neighborhoods. Um, I think that matters. And one of the challenges of school choice, and I know, you know, that's very much where our community has gone, but is, is losing those connections with neighbors who are also in the same schools as you. And I think how do we build that community um, is, is really important. And, you know, like in our neighborhood, we have a pretty proactive neighborhood association. And that's made a huge difference to meeting other families, even if they're not in the same schools. To me, that's the kind of community we need going forward. Because if we're not building that community through neighborhood schools, we, we do need those connections. That's, that's really the building block of, of community. So tell us, what does it look like for a parent to effectively communicate with their legislator? What, what makes you want to open an email, take a phone call? How can we communicate our needs or those really good things going on with our kids' educations in a way that's meaningful? Well, the first thing I'd say is if there's opportunities in your district, if the state senator or state rep is having an event or a town hall or a coffee, go to that. I mean, they're really trying to open the door to you. Um, if you can catch them when they're campaigning, that's even better. This is a campaign year for all representatives are on the ballot next year and half the se state senators. That's a time when they have to listen because they're trying to meet voters. I um, mean, it really helps that. So first of all, if you can get face to face, that doesn't mean you have to come to the state capitol in your neighborhood, in your area is just fine, or if they're coming to an event at your school, just to even briefly make that connection with them as to who you are, that you're a parent, and that you care a lot about education policy. Um, that's the first step. Um, if you can't get face-to-face, -face, I'd say a phone call is the next best, because to have that personal connection first, we get a lot of email, not as many as you would think, frankly, but we get a lot of email, but when it's connected to a person that you've met, um, it, it changes the way you read something. It changes the way you hear something because we are flooded with information up there. And I think when I was outside of that and I was an advocate, I was kind of impatient with it. Like I was like, come on, you should be listening to all of us, but we are kind of flooded with information. So if we already have a relationship with someone, I had my freshman session, a really effective advocate from Putnam City who just cared about what would happen and upfront, actually came to see me in person just to meet me, tell me that they were a parent in the district and that they were watching and concerned about what was going on. And then throughout the session, they would come, uh, they would actually just email me, like, you know, whether it's weekly or every couple of weeks, they would either ask about what was going on with the budget or they would express concerns that, about bills they'd heard about. And they literally wrote me weekly. Now I'm not trying to put pressure on people that they have to communicate weekly in order to be effective. But that's a level of consistency that would be fine. It is fine to communicate that often. Now, saying, hey, I'm mad at you every week might not be a good idea, but saying, watch this bill, I care a lot about this, or I'm hearing that these kinds of things are happening. Is that what you're seeing? Even if you're not getting a response, you're telling them that you're engaged in watching. So even if that's monthly, I would recommend something face-to-face -face and then a monthly email at least would be good. Um, participate in your parent legislative action committee if you have them. If not, you can participate with a statewide one. They're very effective at bringing people together. I know when I was an elementary school parent trying to advocate, we went in groups of two to three to visit with our legislators. We went to the our own legislators where we lived, and we went to the legislator for the school. Um, and you can do both those things, but start with the people where you live. Know who they are. Look them up because they need to know who you are and that you care. You do not have to have a specific ask. Um, you can say, support our public schools. You can say, I care about my kids having, like I was talking about, I want arts education. Like every kid should have access to that. That shouldn't be just some kids getting that. Could be athletics, could be academic opportunities, um, but reminding them that there are parents who are engaged, who care about their schools, I think matters. And anytime you get to invite a legislator to a school event, that's worth it. Um, legislators want to visit. I want to visit schools, but I don't want to inconvenience the schools by showing up. Um, so I, I like to come when they invite me. Um, and that can be a great way for them to build relationship with teachers and, and local parents. So I think often, uh, frequently is probably the best communication style. Um, and then it doesn't have to be naming a specific policy. That's so helpful and such good information. I know, um, 
on the parent side of things, I think it can feel so overwhelming and I will be honest and say, sometimes I get discouraged before I even start, <laughs> but yeah. yeah, while I've certainly had legislators, um, that I have disagreed with those that take the time to talk with me as a parent, even if we're disagreeing about policy or a specific bill, I have had great conversations with legislators I disagree with. And for me as a parent, that has been a beneficial process to go through because it helps me, like you said, understand all the things that they're considering and looking at and what they're going through. Um, and it's helped me understand maybe some of my neighbors that I don't agree with, or sometimes people I live with that I don't <laughs> agree with about yeah, things. Um, so even even if you know that maybe your legislator you're contacting won't have the same thought process as you, I still think it can be really beneficial and helpful as a parent to to go through the process. You know what else? Like, in, even before I was in office, like taking action to me is satisfying because you're if you're frustrated about the way things are going or you feel like things aren't going well, taking action instead of just complaining mm -hmm. uh, really makes a difference to our communities. Because if you're sitting there and you're complaining online or you're disappointed with specific state leaders, um, that's one thing, but it's another to tell them that or to speak up and take that action. And I think shifting for me from that passive um, complaint mindset to taking action, it helped me. It helped me be more engaged with the community. It helped me get a better sense of what I wanted and what I expected in schools. Um, and I think being proactive, I know it's I know it sounds tiring, but really any action is better than inaction. That's great advice. Okay, let's talk about some of the positive things going on in education, um, because when it comes down to it, when I'm really intentional about looking for the positives, they are there. And to me, one of the best things going on is our incredible educators who are working harder than ever to help our kids, not just academically, but grow into really great humans. And I feel like I get to see this every day with the relationships my kids have with their teachers. So where are you finding hope and what are some positive examples you can share from your district? Yeah, I, one of the things I'm blown away by, I mean, about educators, like there has been such a professionalization and so much knowledge gained um, over the last 30, 40 years, as far as what kids need and how kids learn. I'm amazed at things like the science of reading, um, understanding of learning differences. You know, Oklahoma City Public Schools has something like 15 to 20% of children on IEPs. Well, those programs are because we've learned that kids are different and they need to learn differently. To me, that's amazing. I just, I think we've learned the diagnosis part more than we've learned the implementation part at the, at the scale we need. But my, you know, my dyslexic kid 30 years ago, I don't know if anyone would have caught it. I don't know if we would have known how to address it. And she's doing great. Um, because we were able to find those um, experts who understood what she needed. Um, so to me, that differentiation of learning is amazing. Um, is it being done perfectly? No. Um, we don't have the, I don't think large classrooms, I don't think that's feasible and we don't necessarily have the resources needed to, to apply it, but I think we've gotten way better at understanding it. The other big thing I'm amazed by is career orientation. Um, the ICAP that um, Superintendent Hoffmeister implemented um, the the career exploration um, starting early and earlier, and they piloted it with some districts um, six, seven years ago, but now it's been in place for everyone. Um, I'm sure through COVID it got postponed, but it's just the, the mindfulness around exploring career paths, exploring strengths. Um, my high schooler has gone through a wide variety of skill assessments and interest assessments in a way that, boy, I had no clue what I wanted to do in school. And I, I I think career day was more like a few parents telling about their jobs. Now there's such a look at what lights you up, what gets you excited, um, what fires you up. And now we have career tech options for all kids. We have concurrent options for all kids. They can be taking college classes during high school. And then we have um, amazing AP options. And to me, those three options are just outstanding. And if kids start to get a sense of what, what fires them up, what they're excited about, they have all those opportunities at their fingertips now. And a lot of it is paid for by the state. Um, that's huge steps forward. Absolutely. 
So what kinds of education related legislation do parents need to be aware of as we enter the 2024 legislative session? And for you personally, what's on the horizon that you're either concerned about or feeling hopeful about? Well, in terms of concerned, I, I'm concerned about things that limit uh, what our educators and what our media specialists can offer to students. I think in the name of, you know, avoiding um, dangerous material, there's been a chilling effect on educators being able to have books available, being able to allow kids to find books. Um, there are a wide variety of literary tools and opportunities out there that kids need to have access to. And they've all the research shows that kids being able to explore and find those things themselves make a big difference. We have to find a better line there. Of course, we don't want our kids accessing something um, shocking, um, but our parent, parents already have a lot of say in that, making sure that kids stay safe. And our media specialists um, know what they're doing. I, I'm concerned about seeing more of those type of book banning style uh, legislation. Um, it, it's, it's making educators fearful of sharing materials with kids. Um, and we're talking about, you know, children's books. Um, so I hope that, that parents will speak up for the type of um, opportunities they want their kids to have around, around books. Um, uh, that would be a concern. I mean, the other thing is the standardized testing. I, there was a announcement of, uh, by the superintendent, the state superintendent about reemphasizing state testing when they're giving accreditation to our districts. You know, districts are widely varying when it comes to standardized test scores. I'm deeply concerned about that being an emphasis for growth or for being a good district or not. I think you have to look at the parents, you have to look at the families. We know that the number one indicator of kids' success in school is their parents' educational attainment. So um, why are we emphasizing something that's so narrow in terms of the, the bigger picture. I like how Dr. McDaniel from Oklahoma City Schools talks about it as that's one snapshot, one way to understand kids' success and how do we make sure that we're helping them grow to the best of their ability. Um, I also worry about growth being viewed solely by test scores as well, because I think growth is those opportunities in the future and the way that the kids are staying in school, um, learning in new subject areas, those kinds of things. So those are the things I'm worried about. And funding. I'm always worried about funding because I think when we make a big investment like last year, we made a good financial leap. We actually moved up into the middle of the pack for regional averages for per student spending that we have a tendency then to plateau for a long time. And we know that inflation continues upward and it costs more and more to educate students. Um, when we talk about record investments in schools, we got to remember that we have a record number of students as well. So I think we always have to look at it on a per student basis to make sure we're recognizing that Oklahoma's got more and more kids. And Oklahoma City area, the Oklahoma City Metro grew by like 12% over 10 years. So absolutely, we're spending more because we have a whole lot more kids to serve. Um, those are things I'm watching pretty closely. On the plus side, I mean, I'm going to, there's a really big movement around. Uh, access to mental health treatment through our schools, um, how we make sure we're not just referring kids out, but that we're making that very easy. Medicaid, kids who have access to Medicaid um, can be actually receive treatment in the school with their parents' authorization. We have not made that easy for our school districts, and so they have not always been pursuing that. And that could be a way for us to have access to more um, licensed professional counselors, psychologists in our in our schools, if we're using that money that's already available, that's primarily federal money to pay for that. Um, I've seen a bipartisan support around that and just not sure whether it's gonna have to be in legislation or if it's gonna happen in rules. Um, that's one of the big ones. The other big thing I'm working on is the uh, behavioral health provider um, pipeline, trying to make sure more people are going into and staying in Oklahoma with psychiatry, psychology, licensed professional counseling, social work. I know that sounds long-term um, because it really is gonna be have to be a 10 to 20 year push for us to get the kind of numbers of people we have. But I know I tried to call for a counselor for my kid a couple of years ago and we were looking at a, a year long wait to get in. Um, one of the psychologists in my district who does assessments for whether kids have autism or not, told me he's now on an 18 month wait list. That's unacceptable. I mean, if you have a kid and you're trying to understand what's going on with them, you can't wait a year and a half uh, for that. So we need more people in the field. And there's some real Healthy Minds Policy uh, Initiative out of Tulsa has put some amazing research out to show us a pathway for that. Because apparently, if we just have more residency slots, we can keep more psychiatrists in this state. 
I was shocked to learn we only have about 33 child psychiatrists in our whole state. That's a crisis. We need to address it. I mean, if we can, get, you know, have one to two more stay per year, that's going to build up and make sure kids have the access to what they need. And I think those kinds of strategic mindset things, we can't be knee jerk in our approach to policy. We've got to plan better. Um, I think the people are counting on it. When you're talking about the scale of a statewide, every child um, needs access to things. We've got to make sure we're doing that thoughtfully. Again, that's a lot that you get to consider <laughs> every day. Um, but I'm looking forward to seeing some of those positives hopefully come through this session. And it's a good reminder that there are good things going on at the well, state. Well, that, I, I just throw out that mental health, that's a, advocates made that happen for it to be a bipartisan issue. 20 years ago, people did not understand that brain health was important, but that was individuals who, family members who'd gone through challenges with a family loved one with a mental health condition, that was um, people who provide it, that was the schools, say, telling legislators over and over again, look at this, this is a challenge, we need this help. And so now it's bipartisan, you know, People understand that brain health is important. We still have stigmas to uh, uh, overcome, but I think when you look at an advocacy message that's been effective in Oklahoma, that's one that has been very effective. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. As we wrap up our conversation today, what is your main message for parents about the most important ways we can support our educators this year? Well, I think parents just have to know that your voice matters. Teachers can't be the only ones speaking up for schools anymore. We have to know we don't have to think that schools are perfect to speak up for them and be champions for them. But we have to know that resources and policies are in place that are going to support kids well. I think if parents back teachers up on wanting to get kids what they need, um, that's going to make a lot of difference to our educators. Um, that's great advice and such a good reminder for all of us that our voices do make a difference. And sometimes that can be in the form of just a word or a note of encouragement to those teachers who are working so hard every day. And sometimes that looks like advocating for them when they need us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think we've counted on educators and educational leaders to be those voices for kids. And I think it needs to be parents. It has to be parents. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining me today, Senator Kurt, and thank you for all of your great work on behalf of the Metro and the state. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks everyone for listening. Join us next time on Raising OKC Kids.